Perfect. Um, well, I'll just officially introduce myself. I'm Becky George. I'm the Hypothesis Success Manager, uh, working with all of our partners in Alabama, but specifically you all, and excited to be working with you today. Uh, today's session will focus on creative ways to use social annotation in your courses. I know, Katie, your experience, uh, is it Prima? Would you, oh, sorry, I think you were on mute. Yeah, Prima, yeah. Prima, okay. Um, I know you're new, um, so we have a bit of a mix. Um, and then of course, John and, and Jen have joined us as well. Um, and then my colleague, uh, Don Kite has joined us as well. Um, so we have a, a mix of UNA folks and hypothesis folks in here today. Um, since we are such a small group, um, like please, please, ask questions, interrupt, like I wanna make sure this is valuable for you. It's Friday afternoon. Um, for some of you, it sounds like quite a hectic week coming up next week. Um, so I wanna make sure that uh, you're walking away uh, from today's session with some you know, new tricks up your sleeve of how to use Hypothesis or even just how to get started with Hypothesis. Um, and if you all, don't mind just doing quick introductions. I know John and Jen, um, but if there's anything you all want to share, that'd be great. Sure. Um, I'm glad to see Katie and Prima both here. Um, and uh, yeah, we have been really happy with uh, Hypothesis. We've had a lot of really great feedback from folks in the English department and other, some of the other humanities disciplines uh, for using it within Canvas. It is also available online for free. There's a, a one that's not integrated into Canvas. So like if, if you needed to use it that way though, I don't think it would work for um, what you were talking about, Katie, unfortunately. Um, so we're really happy to have um, uh, Becky here to talk about uh, more ways that we can use uh, hypotheses and kind of expand it. And we, since this is going to be recorded, we will put it up with our other um, open ed week uh, stuff that we have so that other people who maybe couldn't make it today, because I had a lot of folks say that they wanted to come, but they were teaching or whatever, they can look at it later. So. So I'm Prema Montero, and my discipline is hospitality uh, and culinary arts, event management. I have no experience with social annotation. And when I saw this, I realized I looked at my calendar and I was open, unlike the other two sessions that we've had previous in, during this week. And I thought, wow, this is cool. This is something I have no idea about. I need to get educated. So uh, <laughs> let's listen in. Yeah, perfect. I'm glad you're here. And hi, I'm Katie, and I teach in the English department, and Hypothesis, they did a webinar session with us, I think during COVID-19, like two years ago, and it was kind of a lifesaver because we had a shift to online teaching. We mostly do face-to-face -face teaching. I was really at a loss for, you know, how to translate, you know, or like create new tools that can engage students in a digital way. And so Hypothesis, I, I've used it in um, when I teach online classes over the summer, for example, I will introduce students to um, like I teach a lot of stuff in prison literature. And so I'll introduce them to some statistics about mass incarceration, give them some like documents from the prison policy initiative or something that gives them an overview and then have them annotate it. And so they just kind of react to it and then they react to each other's reactions. And it's a great way to ease them into and frame the content of the material that we're doing. But I'm interested in learning other ways that um, I can try to integrate annotation into our assignments. So I am pleased to be here and thank you for hosting. Yeah. Uh, suppose just in case, John McGee, I don't think there's anybody uh, that, that doesn't know who I am, but I'm representing my entire department today because they're all uh, doing an interview in the hiring committee. So I'm, I'm happy we're recording this because they'll get a chance to watch it later. Thanks for thanks for joining us. Hopefully, this is better than the interview, but um, you know you can make that decision for yourself, John. <laughs> and I don't know, John Kite. Did you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi. Sorry, my audio is a little bit in and out, but this is John. I work on the partnerships team at Hypothesis, and looking forward to uh, watching the presentation. And thank you all for coming. 
Well, I'll keep rolling things along. I already know your experience um, with Hypothesis, so we'll kind of skip ahead with that. Um, but just so you have an idea of, of what we'll discuss today. And like I said, we can kind of take this in any direction that you all would like. So if you're like, hey, can you demo this, Becky? Or can you talk more about that? Like interrupt me um, at any time. Um, but I do want to just review what social annotation is, what might be some benefits um, for why you would want to use it in your course. And again, I know some of this for uh, Jen, John, and Katie, this will be review. <laughs> um, so apologies for that. Um, I'll demo um, what a hypothesis reading looks like, um, because I know, uh, Promo, you haven't seen that before. Um, and then we'll jump in and talk about creative ways to use social annotation. So different pedagogical approaches, implementation strategies, um, and then of course, there'll be some time for Q&A &E at the end as well. So jump right in, jump in right in. I'm actually gonna put a poll. I'm gonna send a poll your way. Um, so if you wanna just share, and you do have the option to select more than one, but what do you struggle most with when it comes to students reading? And it could be reading your syllabus. It could be reading a case study. It could be reading a project description. So it could be a lot of things that they're reading. So I'm seeing so for if you have some more some more coming in. Nice, I'll go ahead and that poll and share the results in case you're curious how your colleagues um, answered today. Um, these top ones are, I will have to say, ones that uh, most <laughs> faculty that I work with um, respond similarly, similar, similarly. Excuse me. I don't know why that's hard to say this afternoon. Um, uh, so you're not alone. Um, and that is where, you know, a tool like Hypothesis Social Annotation can help you, you know, figure out whether or not your students did the reading, knowing what they understood, what misconceptions are coming out. Are they kind of like leading themselves or leading each other in the wrong direction? You get clues about that. Um, even just being actively engaged in the text um, can be a challenge. Um, so thank you for thank you for your honesty and for sharing that. Um, and like I said, that's where a tool like Hypothesis can hopefully come in. Hypothesis is a social annotation tool with the goal of helping make reading more active, more visible, and more social. More active in the sense that students have a place to actively engage, anchor their thoughts, their ideas, while they're thinking. Um, as we know, it's, it's easy to be a distracted reader, especially when looking at digital text. Uh, but if students have a place to anchor their thoughts and ideas while they're reading, it gives them kind of a, a physical space to think through their reading um, and to be actively engaged. Uh, it's obviously a great tool for visibility, visibility to the reader themselves while they're reading, but also visibility to you, the instructor. So it can give you some of those clues into what students might be thinking, what they might be uh, understanding or misunderstanding. I'm sure we've all been in a, in a course meeting where you ask a question about a piece of, of text that students were expected to come class prepared with and you get blank stares, awkward silence. Did they not do it? Do they not understand it? Um, so this gives you some of that insight. And then it is a social annotation tool. So those thoughts, those ideas, those questions that students have, they're not isolated as if they were annotating a paper copy of the text like we have for so long, um, but they're visible to everyone in the course. So there can be some peer-to-peer -peer learning, there can be some collaboration or cross, um, classmates to come to understanding together. Um, and then of course you can choose as a faculty member to participate however you'd like um, in that collaborative reading. So what does it look like, right? So I know Katie, you know, John, uh, Jen, you know what it looks like. Um, but in case you don't know what it looks like, I'm gonna jump over here into a, just the Canvas course and show you exactly what it looks like. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and launch my reading. So hypothesis can be added directly to an assignment or a module item. This happens to be a chemistry example, which is I know not applicable to either of you, um, but it's um, an open textbook. So I thought it'd be a good example to show um, this week. <laughs> um, uh, 
and it's an annotation sidebar. Um, so here I happen to have chapter four on DNA, RNA, and the human genome. Um, as a former science educator, I suppose this is a little bit biased, but I find this particularly interesting. Um, but you'll see here what's happened is what's been added is this annotation sidebar. Um, so I'll just zoom in here a little bit so you can see the annotation sidebar. Um, so you'll see here that all you have to do um, to annotate is these annotations are anchored in the text. So if someone's writing about nucleosides, it looks like they're adding a definition of where that comes from. So a side of sugar, where nucleotide is the total monomer. So getting kind of into the uh, nitty gritties of um, the components and structure of the monomer. Um, you'll see here that students are replying to each other. So Jennifer put an initial annotation um, and then Jamie kind of added an ad additional response to um, um, help define that a little bit further about the difference between the bases. Uh, as I scroll down in the annotation sidebar, uh, you'll see that images can be added to annotations. Um, so I'd be curious to hear from you if your students, Katie, have added multimedia in any way to annotations. No, I didn't even know that was possible. They always okay. just run it through text. Well, I'd be happy to demo that. Um, we can talk a little bit about um, what adding multimedia looks like. So yeah, you can add images, videos, links. You'll even see here that um, both an image and a link were added. Um, so you can make those connections with external resources. Um, you can add tags to annotations as a way to categorize or organize annotations. Um, and we, I can show you what that looks like as well. Um, so that is the annotation sidebar. It kind of helps that reading come to life. It's taking the discussion board and it's right on top of the text instead of um, kind of navigating between the reading and a discussion board. Um, but the annotations are all anchored in the text itself. So since... I know this may be a review for some of you, but while I'm in here, I did want to just jump in and show what it looks like to create an assignment before I get to kind of creative ways to use the tool. Um, and I'll use this assignment example um, to demo um, adding multimedia and so on. So hypothesis can be added to an assignment or a module item. The only difference between those um, is that um, if you want to enable speed grader, you'll go the assignment route. If you just don't want it to be a graded assignment, you can add it to a module item. I'm gonna go ahead and click assignment. We will name our reading today. And I happen to have the yellow wallpaper pulled up from Project Gutenberg. Um, so I'm gonna use that as our example today. I read this in high school and I don't think I've thought about it since then. Um, so I should probably, that should be my homework for the weekend. I should probably review it. Um, I remember not liking it as like a teenager, but perhaps I'd think differently about it. Um, so I'm naming my assignment with the yellow wallpaper. Of course, the description is a great place to put guidelines for students. What do you want them to do in the text? Um, you can keep it super simple. Uh, you know, read the article, create two annotations, reply to two of your peers. Um, we also have quite a few um, resources that you could even copy and paste. So I'm gonna paste some very simple instructions for students today. Read the article, make an annotation asking a question, comment on something you notice in the text, reply to a classmate's question, make a page note explaining what you think the author's main goal is. So do four things today, um, but I do wanna point out and I'll put a link to this in the chat. Um, this is pretty recent, um, but we have annotation starter assignments. Um, so if you're looking for directions and you don't wanna start from scratch for what your annotation assignment should be, um, you can always take a look at these um, and you could adapt them for your own course. Um, so there's some general ones. I have one specifically for STEM, which, which wouldn't necessarily apply to you. There's some instructions you could use, use for reading an academic article. Something to think about as you start planning for next term is doing a syllabus annotation assignment. That's a very popular first annotation assignment. Um, so you could click this link here and you could copy and paste these instructions for students and use them in your course. 
So know that this resource is there for you um, to come back to. So I'll pop back over to my assignment here. I've kept my instructions very simple, as I mentioned earlier. Um, I can customize how many points it's out of. I'm having students do four things, so I'll just make it out of four points today. Um, and then submission type, I'll select external tool. And then I'll hit find. Um, and I'm in our demo environment, just you know, so it may look slightly different in yours. Of course, you'll see all of the external tools that are available for you. I'm going to click hypothesis. Once you click hypothesis, it will ask where your reading is coming from. So you can enter the URL of a web page or PDF. You can select a PDF that's stored in Canvas, Google Drive, or OneDrive. And then we are currently piloting integrations for J JSTOR and Vital Source. Um, mine is the Project Gutenberg uh, page. So I'm going to select the URL option. So I'm going to copy this, paste that there, and hit submit. Now, Hypothesis does integrate with Canvas group sets. Um, so depending on your course size, depending on the length of the text, um, it may make sense to split your students up into smaller reading groups. Um, so you can choose to do that. You would create your group set first. Then you would toggle on, this is a group assignment. It'll ask which group set you want to assign it to. Um, and then students are annotating in their own individual groups versus as a whole course. Katie, are you using, and apologies, Katie, I'm like calling on you a lot. So let me know if you're like, hey, I'm, I'm good participating. Um, <laughs> uh, are you using groups at all? Or are students all annotating um, as an entire course group? I don't know what I've been using, but the students in the course were able to see each other's annotations and respond to each other. Um, okay. so I, but it was, it was graded as an individual assignment, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So all of the assignments, whether you set it up as like a whole class assignment or a group assignment, they're all graded individually. So the grading experience is the same. So that's good um, just to clarify that. Um, groups would be if you wanted them in smaller reading groups. So if you wanted like students, um, like let's say five groups of four or however many students you have. Otherwise they're all annotating as a class together. So I'll toggle that off and I will put the resource for Canvas groups with Hypothesis in the chat as well. And I'll hit continue and select to get out of this window. I recommend this setting, but the tool works just fine without it. It just makes it much more visually appealing if the reading opens in a new tab and it's not scrunched into the Canvas window. And I'm gonna go ahead and save and publish here so you all can see it. So of course I see my description for what I want students to do when they read the yellow wallpaper. And I'll go ahead and load it. And this is what an assignment would look like with no annotations, right? So I'm the first one to open it. So obviously no annotations, unlike the other one I showed you, the chemistry textbook. Um, so this is what um, it would look like. And then to create annotations, you select text, and then you have the option to either annotate or highlight. So as soon as I select text, this pop-up appears. And if I click annotate, a text box appears where I can start anno annotating. I can add tags to my annotations as a way to categorize or organize annotations. So if students were going through their first step was to ask all of their questions in the text, maybe they're simply tagging their annotations with the word question. It's then easy to go back through and search through tags and see where all the questions are coming up. And you could pull up all of the annotations that have that tag question. Maybe they're identifying imagery or a theme. Um, or exhibiting some sort of skill that you want them to show in their annotation, they could tag that. So your annotation can, can contain zero tags or as many tags as you would like. And then the last step is to post my annotation. Now um, that that annotation is posted, anyone in the course could reply. So just to show you what a reply looks like. I've replied to my annotation, of course, that's anchored below the initial annotation. So that conversation could continue and build on each other, or students could jump in and annotate another section of the text. And it's anchored in a different part of the text. 
now I, I can look at the and be like, oh, what did someone annotate about romantic felicity? What did someone annotate about ordinary? So you can kind of click through those as, you, of course, makes it much easier once you have more and more annotations tied to the text. Any questions about just those basics? I have a question actually. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if this has been adjusted in hypothesis yet, but um, when I used it previously, instead of having a submission date, it had this weird like 2000, I can't remember, it was like a generic date. So it's hard to tell if students were submitting the assignment and all are just opening it or when they were submitting it, if they were submitting it on time when I was working with speed grader. I don't know if that makes any sense, but I, I think there was a back and forth I have with John about this at one point with the hypothesis person. And you were talking about maybe creating a submission button. So I was wondering if there was any movement on that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so there's still not a submission button in the way that there's traditionally would be with Canvas assignments, um, but you will see, and I'll just go in, um, I'll go into the other one to show you speed grader because I'm, I am a instructor in this course, so it won't be really useful to show you on the yellow wallpaper. So I'm in the speed grader view. Um, and now it tells you when they last submitted an annotation. So that submitted date used to, what you're referring to, Katie, just for some context for anyone who's unfamiliar, it used to share like an arbitrary date. It was a made up date that could never be possible because it was like back from like early 2000s, if I recall correctly. Um, but now it shows you the last annotation, the date and time of the last annotation. Um, and then each individual annotation itself shows you the date that it was submitted. So Jennifer here happened to annotate um, on all of the same day. And it looks like her last annotation was at close to 2.30 on the 21st of October. Great, thank you. And if they open yeah. it up without submitting anything, then what does that look like? You wouldn't. So they'd have to actually hit create an annotation for the date to change. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And I apologize. That's I've okay. got to go and pick up my kid from school, but I'm going to watch no, the rest okay. of this on the recording. Yeah. I appreciate y'all. Yeah. Enjoy your weekend. Thank you. You too. <laughs> Thanks for joining Katie. Perfect. Any questions about the speed grader view? This is great. I just really I had no idea. I'm so glad I attended this. Um, <laughs> I have um, some students, like uh, the international students, and they are required to take a certain number of classes on campus, face to face. Okay. And it's just like really like pulling hair to, you know, get this for all of them. But I can see that this would be a great way to have them engage with one another. I mm -hmm. just have them writing chapter notes because they're all in different classes and I can't be teaching that number of classes, but I do need them face to face. So the best I can do is to make sure that they show up on campus for the amount of time they're required to. But this would be so great in helping them to learn and they do come around because it's a really small group to understanding that the more time they put into this and like writing chapter notes is going to help them do better in the test, which they mm -hmm. all have to take, you know, unit tests yeah. like every three chapters. Um, and it's more fun when you're doing it with other people. Uh, exactly. So when you're I, not sort of isolated and how you're trying to, to understand the text and talk about the text. Yeah. Yeah. And even if it isn't, understand some some content is understanding others is it's just staying focused and <laughs> yeah. I think if you have other people that you can be doing that with and you know the whole almost like social annotation you know uh, mm -hmm. it's more meaningful than just making chapter notes yourself and yeah. meeting the deadline and you know actually I could have them do it while they are in the class there on their laptops Mm -hmm. and use that time you know quite productively and yeah. enjoy it more than yeah, otherwise yeah yeah that's a really good point that you just made we hear about annotations taking place both synchronously asynchronously students could sit together in class almost do like a think pair share mm -hmm. where they're talking about it but then they're annotating their own kind of final thoughts um they can discuss what they're you know, like it doesn't just have to be in hypothesis. It could also be a verbal conversation um, that's taking place around their annotations as well. So yeah, really good. 
um, yeah, I'm long, definitely excited for you to give it a go. Yeah. I am going to jump back to my slide deck here. Yeah. Um, and and talk, oh, notes. sorry, go ahead. Sorry, we're writing chapter notes could be like really boring, like, oh gosh, you know, she needs us to write these notes and then she'll just give us 10 points for it, you know. This thing, I think it could take on more of a fun aspect to it, especially when they come to the class. And I don't mind if they sit and write their notes in the class on their computers or by pen, pencil, or if they study something else. But I'm sorry, I'm required to have you here for this time. You're going to, and they actually really enjoy it because it helps them to set aside time to study um, mm -hmm. forced. <laughs> but yeah. um, I think it would be a lot more fun if they actually focused on the one chapter they were supposed to, and as a group, began doing this, these annotations. That would be yeah. very fun for them. Yeah. yeah, that's a really great, great approach. Definitely more, more engaging for them. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and just run through um, some ideas for how to kind of take annotations to the next level. Frequently we hear, okay, go ahead, create two annotations, reply to two of your peers. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Like that's a great way to get started, but there's also a lot more kind of out of the box ways to use social annotation. Um, so I'm gonna talk about some pedagogical um, approaches and strategies. These are by no means like just for annotation. They just work with annotation. So they might be some um, strategies like think pair share, which I keep bringing up. Like it's not just an annotation activity. It could be used with a lot of different um, approaches to learning and teaching, um, but um, these are um, some ways to kind of take annotations to the next level. Um, so thinking about creative ways to prompt student annotations. Um, you could be very explicit about what students are doing in the text. So giving these them these prompts. So giving them, telling them to do like a three, two, one, three things they learned in the text, two things that they confirmed what they already knew, one question they still had. So in this case, if you had students do a three, two, one, they'd be maybe creating six total annotations throughout the text, mm -hmm. identifying what was something they learned, what was something they already knew. Um, this could also be a way to use tags they could tag their annotations with learned confirmed question. It's easy for an instructor then to search through, okay, what are all the things they already knew? What are all the things that they still have questions about? So you can give you kind of a quick view if you're using tags. Uh, the four A's would be another approach. So in this case, students would be creating four annotations. Uh, what assumption does the author have the text hold? What do they agree with in the text? What do they want to argue with? And what parts of the text do they aspire to? Of course, you could make it the three A's or you could change uh, change it, but gives you um, uh, another strategy. And this would also be um, work well with tags. They could tag, of course, if they're writing about an assumption, they could tag their annotation with the word assumption. Um, sit pretty similar. They would be creating three annotations. Um, one, that's a surprising fact something that was interesting and one that was troubling or tricky for them. And again, could tag their annotations. So you could pinpoint exactly what was tricky for students, what was troubling for them um, in their annotations in that reading. Some other ideas would be, um, they could use a protocol for responding to their classmates. Um, so rather than just kind of, I agree with you, Don, nice job. Thanks for annotating, um, but having them be really um, thoughtful um, and meaningful in the ways they're responding to their classmates. So perhaps it, they have to create three responses to their peers' annotations. One of those has to be something that they like, so something maybe they connected with, something it made them think of, something that wowed them. Maybe one of their responses to a peer has to be about asking thoughtful questions. Um, so digging a little bit deeper, what did they mean by that? Did you consider this? Um, asking them why. Um, and then their third response to their peer could be giving a suggestion. Like, do you think you should think about this? Or you could have considered this. Um, so kind of taking their responses to the next level and how they're responding to each other in their annotations. Being much more... Uh, much more guidelines than go ahead and reply to two of your peers. Okay, well, what does a reply look like? What should your reply contain? 
Um, hypothesis and social annotation can also be a great way to just engage the community, um, making it a space for students to bounce ideas off of each other, um, create that community of engaged learners. Um, and these, it says face-to-face -face classes, but I do think these work both um, in face-to-face -face classes, hybrid and online, depending on how you have it set up. Um, you could use annotations as a springboard for discussion. So you could pull up the annotations from the class's reading, use them to guide the class discussion. Um, I've frequently worked with faculty who've had a student leader be responsible for this part. So each week it's a different student leader who's bringing up kind of the key topics that were discussed in annotations, anything that was still left um, not explained. So if there was any questions that were unanswered, being like, hey, we need to discuss this, this needs to come up. Um, you could open class with an annotation summary activity. So have students review the readings and annotations for a few minutes. Uh, then they do a pair, pair with a partner and come to a shared summary of ideas and questions. Um, it's great to have students annotate any material that maybe you're sharing with them. So maybe you have lecture notes that you share with them or a slide deck. You could turn that slide deck into a PDF and have students annotate that. They could do that before class. It doesn't even say during, but I think during would work just fine. Like why have them reinvent the wheel? Um, have them just annotate on top, annotate their notes on top of that PDF during class. Of course, it could also be a space for them after class where they're reviewing what was discussed in class that day. Uh, thinking about some asynchronous approaches, um, oftentimes when students are annotating, they're probably annotating from their own voice. Um, but why not have them take on another persona and engage with another perspective? So instead of writing from their own voice in their annotations, they're taking on the role of a scholar, a historical figure, a character in the text, maybe someone with a very differing opinion or thought. Um, so even kind of touching into that controversial realm of thinking about someone else's perspective. Uh, you can also give students different roles in the text, so they can have different participation roles. These are just some examples. You could have someone who's responsible for asking all of the questions throughout the text, someone who's kind of pushing the thinking, uh, someone who's the illustrator, so they're adding all those multimedia components, they're adding images, they're adding videos to the annotations to have that reading come to life. Um, and then someone can maybe be the connector and connecting annotations throughout the discussion thread, throughout that annotation sidebar. I've heard of like a historian too, lots of different roles, of course, lots of different, a variety of group roles out there. Uh, this is a bit of a fun one. <laughs> um, this doesn't mean that they would be actually using social media. Their annotations would mimic social media. So it's probably something they're used to. Um, if they're not used to it, that's okay. Honestly, in today's world, whether we want them to use social media or not, they're going to. And like in a lot of future employment opportunities they have, they need to be familiar. Like I will honestly say our VP of education wished I was more active on Twitter and it's just like not my thing. Um, so, you know, <laughs> that's just a, a downfall of me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I sympathize. I'm not on any social media, not even Facebook, never have been. And I just really feel that that's a, that's a shortcoming of mine. Uh, I didn't have the time to begin with. And it's just become one of those things that now I'm not doing it now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But your previous slide, Becky, I really enjoyed yeah. it because I was thinking of one of my classes where I had the kids do like a behavioral interview for a job. Mm. And I could just see posting that as an assignment and then all of them you know, being the interviewee and posting their ideas and their responses and even making them in groups where um, that way everyone in the group has to provide a different response. Otherwise, yeah. in a class of 20, 30, 40, you might be getting the same copy paste when people are just coming in before the due date on time. You know, Yeah, that is definitely ready. where the groups yeah, the groups can be handy for that, splitting students up into smaller groups. They're not having to like compete over real estate, right? Like yeah. they have space to come up with meaningful, non-repetitive annotations that yeah. are additive versus just being like the exact same thing that someone else said. 
And I yeah. think they just have so much fun just all being able to pitch in and type mm -hmm. this in because that's how they, have you know, this just really feeds into what they do. Uh, the mm -hmm. same thing for hospitality law where I have case studies. Uh, it would be awesome for them to respond to it this way in a group uh, than in a formal assignment. So Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's a really good point. Yeah, case case study annotation is, we hear a lot about that. So yeah, that's that's great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so yeah, the social media, um, you know, whether it's something they're comfortable with or not, they're not actually using like TikTok, Twitter, or Instagram. They're just creating a post that's like they were posting on a platform for social media, um, which gives them good practice in like, if they're creating a tweet, it has to be limited to a number of characters. What is the main point they have to get across in those 280 characters? Um, so kind of practicing those skills that they will ultimately probably in a future role have to develop, like refining their, their thoughts, adding an image, of, image, adding tags that are related. So if they wanted to go out into kind of the space of social media and have an intellectual conversation, what would they say? Um, so they're just practicing this as an annotation on top of their reading. Um, so thinking about some ways to promote critical thinking through annotation. Um, you could be really explicit about the kinds of questions um, that students are asking throughout the text. So encourage them to think of open-ended questions. This could also be group work as well, maybe each week different groups are responsible for different questions, um, or maybe each student is responsible for each level of questions. They have to ask three different questions throughout the text. Um, and then you could assign student facilitators to, to kind of reel in those questions. What are the common questions that are coming up? Have these questions been answered um, as a way to kind of lead that discussion? Um, being really explicit about how students are connecting to the text. Um, so they could be making the text to self, text to text, text to world, and text to media. These are also great opportunities for them to add multimedia components as well. So if they read about something and they're connecting it to a real world event, they could link out to that real world event, maybe an article about it, maybe a video that talks about it. Maybe they heard something about it. Um, in a song, that's kind of a stretch, I guess, and, and maybe an example that we've been talking about, um, but you never know. And they're linking out to a YouTube video of that. Um, so um, guiding students on how to make different connections with the text. Um, it can also be just a way to assess students' understanding of the text. Um, so I'm gonna share a few strategies. Um, these are all visible thinking strategies. It comes from Harvard Project Zero. And I'll just put a link to Harvard Project Zero's visible thinking strategies. There's, you could kind of go down a, um, a rabbit hole <laughs> of the thinking routine, but these are a few um, that work really well um, with annotation. And they may seem a bit elementary, but I think sometimes students need these guidelines or maybe it's their final annotation. Um, so compass points activity is one. Students would be creating four annotations. I've seen this work really well with the syllabus. So having students annotate the syllabus, they identify what do they still need to know that they don't, that they haven't found out in the reading, what excites them, what worries them, the S could be a lot of things. It could be what stance are they taking on it? What suggestions do they have? Is there anything, you know, in the case of the syllabus that surprises them about your course? Um, so I bring up the syllabus. The syllabus is a very popular first annotation assignment because it's a low stakes way to get students comfortable using a new tool. Um, and also just ensuring that students read the syllabus with a year time and time again, that that can be a challenge. Um, so something to consider. Um, even giving students a sentence frame, um, such as I used to think and now I think, this could be their final annotation. So they identify the one part of the text that changed their thinking. Um, or maybe they're identifying another student's annotation that changed their thinking. And they're responding to that student and reflecting on how their thinking changed after reading another student's annotation. Uh, 
Um, it could be a form of an exit annotation or almost like an exit ticket. So students could um, use one of the final prompts to add a final annotation to the end of the reading. Um, maybe they're summarizing it. Maybe they're sharing something they still don't understand. Maybe they're you know, sharing the most important fact or idea and explaining why they chose it. They could describe something from the reading that they'd like to learn more about and why, and maybe they add more information. So they wanna learn more about this and they're gonna add some research or resources um, where they can find out more about it. And then thinking about just how to get students to engage with course documents. I know a lot of times when we talk about social annotation and reading, we're thinking about like articles, case studies, um, but um, I've talked about the syllabus, but students could annotate other course documents like assignment instructions, um, project instructions, essay question prompts. So they're not necessarily doing the writing of the essay or the project in annotations, but they're annotating the directions so that it's super clear before they even jump into the project or the assignment itself what's expected of them. Um, have students annotate a rubric for a project so that it's very clear, like they know what's expected of them, you know that they know what's expected of them um, before they've already kind of gone down a path and maybe it's not the correct path for that particular assignment or assessment. Um, study guides too, as you start thinking about, um, you mentioned your students um, take a unit unit test. So maybe if you have any form of study guide, they could annotate that together, um, share their notes in the threads about like the main topics that might be on it. Um, so a shared space for them to collaborate, but it doesn't necessarily have to, it could be happening asynchronous where students are, you know, using that shared space to prepare together. Okay, I've done a ton of talking. <laughs> uh, so thank you. I'd be curious, you know, I know you mentioned a few that kind of stood out to you, but I'd be curious, you know, and I know I'm putting you on the spot, but if you had any um, ideas, anything in particular that you're you're interested in trying with your students? Well, like I said, some of the things uh, with the chapter notes, this semester I have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight students in these individual classes. So four are in one class in the morning and then three are in another class one afternoon and one in a third class, you know, but uh, for all of them to be doing this together and even the one who's alone for her to do it, I think it would just make it so much more fun for her rather than writing chapter notes. And when it's a small class like that, I can I could even give them an option. You know, would you guys like to get together and brainstorm and do it this way? Or do you just want to be on your own writing your notes and submitting them? So being able yeah. to give them options is nice on something like mm -hmm. this. Um, the other one was, as I said, uh, the case studies, uh, interviews, role playing, because in my area of hospitality, uh, we can do so much by way of role playing. Mm -hmm. And uh, where one student takes on one role and see how the other one responds and then you could give each pair, you know, you could have them pair up and give each like two scenarios and see how each of them responds when one is in control, like maybe the guest and the front desk agent or the guest and the housekeeper or server or whatever, you know, yeah. uh, guest complains. How would you handle that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a really good. Yeah, the role play of it. I really like that. Yeah, yeah that's a really um, good part. So I think um, I I also like the one where you had the that's yours. It's not me, but the prompts, you know, the three, two, one, the four A's mm -hmm. uh, sit. Those are such great examples. And kids love that kind of stuff, you know, because it's not you saying 10 because 10 sounds like a nice number in the metric system. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, because yeah. it makes grading else. easy because you're like one, two, three, four, ten. OK, yeah. yeah. It's something else that's that. fun. Um, mm -hmm. So I think this has so much potential to make it fun for them. It's so much like social media. <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, uh, in like a safe, I don't know, it sounds kind of cheesy, I guess, but in a safe space, right? Like inside right. of the LML, inside Canvas, 
just and, just and then, while you're so learning think, not wasting time I mean yeah it, there could be a social media platform that's safe but you know you're just wasting time they just told me like on average they're each spending seven or eight hours a day on social media I was shocked I was just really shocked. I'm like, wow, that's your day gone. That's a whole day's worth of work. Yeah. Gone. Um, and yeah, so I think this is, I'm, I'm so happy I sat in on this. Yeah, great. Um, well, I, of course, will share the slide deck. Um, I'll share it with Thank you via you. email so you have that. There's okay. also a bunch of other resources in this slide deck that you can come back to. So mm -hmm. I'm here to support you and your colleagues beyond today's session. So feel free, like use me as a resource. If you have questions, um, if you wanna kind of even click through any of the red, red in this slide deck are links. So you can always come back to those. Um, we have um, lots of resources out there. Um, yeah. I'm. I'm excited. You're excited. I'm, I'm yeah. curious to hear how it goes for you and yeah. your students. Um, yeah, excited for anyone watching the recording at a later date. Reach out to me and happy to help them get started as well. So you said you'll be sharing the slides and uh, that'll be with um, Jen and John. Yeah, I mean, I don't I can go ahead. So, and yeah, I, sorry, them, go ahead. I have them open already because she shared the link, uh, yeah. the bit.ly link in the chat. So I have them open already yeah. and I'll make sure that they're available. And then um, Becky, if you can send me a copy of the recording afterwards, um, we will put it up with our other recordings from um, Open Ed Week um, and they'll be accessible from our OER uh, webpage. Perfect. Great. Excellent. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Yeah. yeah All of welcome. you. Thank you. Yeah. I hope you all have a, a wonderful weekend. Good luck with everything next week and yeah, reach out if I can be of any any help. Thanks Thank so you. much, Becky. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Bye.